Uh, welcome to this session titled, What If Scientists Are the New Chefs? Uh, this session is going to be quite interactive. We're going to be engaging all of you in, in this conversation. Uh, the idea here is that from synthetic meat to gene-altering pesticides, scientists are exploring new solutions to feed the world. What if most of our food is designed by man and not by nature? And so what we have today is, um, I think that the, the, the reason we're, we're thinking about this is because um, when, when we contemplate where we're going on the planet, uh, the projections are that by mid-century there will be about nine billion of us. And there are also estimates that we're going to need to double world food production to meet the meet the demands of this larger population. And one wonders why do you need to double food production if you're not doubling the population beyond the seven plus billion we already have. And the reason for that is that there is um, an increasing desire to eat higher on the food chain, higher quality protein, more meat and dairy, and all of those, uh, those high quality proteins <coughs> require food, water, I mean, they require land, water, resources, energy, uh, and uh, expansion of the agricultural food footprint. And so the, the reason for this discussion today is, is there a possibility that by perhaps uh, unlinking from that expanding footprint of agriculture, we may be able to actually uh, meet these demands for food by doing things like perhaps uh, laboratory enhancement or growing some of the protein that we need in artificial environments. And so, um, who, uh, a couple of examples of that, for example, are like synthetic lab-grown meat or milk uh, or even 3D printed uh, meat. And who we have here today uh, as part of this, as our panel to discuss this, uh, we have uh, Mark Post, who's a professor and chair of physiology at the University of Maastricht in, in the Netherlands, uh, who's going, who has um, pioneered work in in vitro meat. And a couple of years ago, you may have heard about um, lab-grown hamburger, right? And we can hear from Mark on that issue. We have Laura Nystrom, who's an assistant professor of food biochemistry at uh, Ita in Zurich, Switzerland, who focuses on um, fortifying foods, improving the nutrient quality of foods, making foods more sustainable. Uh, we have um, Christopher Nelson, who's chief executive officer of Chemin Industries, which is a, which is a firm that, that is uh, devoted to providing food and feed additives for the livestock animal trade. And, uh, uh, Richard Jefferson, who is Chief Executive Officer of Cambia in Australia and Professor of Biological Innovation at Queensland University of Technology. And he is, uh, his focus is on dem democratizing innovations. And one side note, as we know that um, genetically modified organisms are all part of our ongoing discussion about acceptance of different kinds of foods. Richard did the first ever genetically modified crop in 1987. Uh, did you say beating Monsanto by one day of a <laughs> GMO potato? So what we're going to do first to try to get a sense of the um, temper of the room is to ask the audience a question about your feelings about uh, synthetic and bioengineered food. And so I'll run through the, these choices. You can see them on, on the screen. One, I'm worried about the implication. What I'm going to do is read them all off, and then I'll come back, and I'll let each of you <coughs> vote on which one, OK, so that we can get a sense of which of these issues. OK, the first, I'm worried about the implications on the environment. Second, I think it's a great opportunity to use resources more efficiently. I'm concerned it may be bad for my health. Since scientists agree that it's safe, then, I, then so do I. 
<laughs> it's okay as long as food packaging is clearly labeled. And the last, I'm so confused, I don't know what to think. So can I vote? Yeah. Okay, so the first one, I'm worried about the implications on the environment. Raise your hands. Do we have any votes in the room for all right? Okay, got it. Okay, the second. I think it's a great opportunity to use resources more efficiently. Okay, third one. I'm concerned it may be bad for my health. Okay. Since scientists agree that it's safe, then so do I. <laughs> yeah, I thought we should raise Can we vote? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, and the next one, it's okay as long as food packaging is clearly labeled. And the last one, I'm so confused, I don't know what to think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. Vote early, vote often. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. thank you all, and it appears as though uh, we have um, uh, the leading uh, response was, I think it's a great opportunity to use resources more efficiently with 17 votes, and right behind it, I'm concerned it may be bad for my health, and the others were lagging in a second or third tier. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, we're going to go around the room, and each of our panelists are going to uh, lay out some of their views on these issues, uh, talk about their work, uh, and um, try to focus on uh, you know, what they, each of them see as the most exciting or urgent issue to address on the topic, and also you know, what, might we, what might we see in this area in the next decade or so. So why don't I start with... Uh, um, Professor Post. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, I, I think you already mentioned it that um, we are all into high quality proteins. We, um, uh, not maybe not necessarily because of the idea of it or the, um, or the health aspect of it, but more because we, it, it's all ingrained in our culture. Um, we do realize now increasingly that uh, production of high quality proteins actually puts a lot of pressure on our um, environment, on our resources, and um, at the same time we want to keep our consumption pattern as sort of traditional as possible. So that's why exactly those reasons were the ones that we, um, uh, we developed our technology on, and the reason why we did it is to create beef, because I think beef is one of the, the, the villains here, if you like not really a villain in the traditional sense, but really one of the culprits, where um, we put a lot of resources into feeding cows that eventually produce, uh, pro, um, provide us with high quality proteins, but it's a very inefficient production system. And uh, there are many more animals out there that are much more efficient. There are many more biological systems that are much more efficient. Um, yet we still like that product. We want that product. So. Uh, there is now a way coming from the medical field to produce the same tissue with just using the cells from these cows and not using the entire animal. Um, that potentially can be very resource efficient, um, yet it will, and it, it produces exactly the same tissue, yet it's grown in a completely different way. It doesn't have the same sort of cultural aspects that uh, beef has uh, in a traditional way. So there is a big issue in, well, safety, as has been um, uh, expressed, but there is also a sort of cultural issue in that we need to think about whether we want to go that route, uh, that cultural route into a, a, a very different production system of food in general, and beef in particular, um, to, in order to reach those goals of uh, feeding the entire world population without the environmental footprint. 
So why don't you talk a bit about the work you're doing specifically on the creation of, um, of uh, lab-grown meat? Yeah, so we, um, it, it's a very simple methodology. Uh, you can do this at home if you like, um, where you take uh, stem cells. Well, th that you cannot do at home, but you can order them through the internet. Take stem cells from a cow, uh, let them proliferate, which they are naturally um, inclined to do. And then when you have sufficient numbers, what their other natural inclination is to make meat from it, because that's what they do in the body. And if you create the right conditions, that's also what they do outside of the body. And uh, that way you basically produce beef. You have to put resources in it. You have to create the environment. You have to feed them. But the, um, the, the opportunity here is that that conversion of feed into animal proteins will be at some point much more efficient than in a cow. What do you feed these cells? We feed the cells basically sugars, amino acids, and vitamins and minerals coming from uh, vegetable sources. So it recreates essentially the kind of diet that you would give to a, a, a beef animal or? A yes, but without, without needing to grow the entire animal and with, uh, without the methane exhaust and, and just in a very uh, controlled manner. Okay. Uh, <coughs> So Dr. Nystrom, why don't you talk about your work? Yeah, um, our work has, as, as you also mentioned, we're working quite a lot with health promoting compounds, compounds that we can find from foods, from plants, from the nature, modifying those for optimization of the food, uh, of the health benefits for humans, but then at the same time trying to find compounds that are beneficial for the food. So or for, for the products, so for example, extending shelf life of products and, and uh, finding ways to uh, improve product quality overall, also from a sensory and technological point of view. We are, or the science that we're doing involves identification of new compounds from plant, basically plant, mostly, mostly plant-based materials and identifying those, finding in which types of food or plant tissues we can find these compounds, how we could extract them for use in, in, um, in food applications. However, for many compounds, uh, the problem is that they're not present in the natural sources in cont contents which are high enough or which would be economically feasible as raw, raw materials for extraction. And therefore, we're trying to find ways to, to take essentially the building blocks of these compounds and use different enzymatic technologies to combine them and then produce these same compounds that you find in the, in the natural product, we're trying to produce and or producing those then in the lab where they can then be scaled up to a, a level which is then economically profitable. Um, we also are very much interested in, in analyzing within any class or group of compounds which are reasonably similar to identify which are the individual properties of the different molecular species. So if, if you take, uh, let's say, 10 phenolic acids, which one of those is the one that is the most active and then try to apply that <coughs> um, and, and study that further and really identify the individual differences of, of in, or the differences between individual components. Um, in many of our, our studies, we've been sort of testing on wouldn't it be nice to combine this and this molecule and, and came up with, with what we at first thought that were completely new compounds and what we were able to generate. However, since our analytical methods are now getting much, much more accurate and sensitive, we have been able to find also these compounds that we thought that we generated also in the nature. So proving that we, there is a lot of diversity in the nature, what we yet haven't explored and where we can then work on a bit further. So why don't you give us some examples, specific examples of where this work would then be applied to uh, foods that we would come across in our daily lives? Well, for example, one of the group of compounds that we're working on is our sterile phenolates. So they're plant sterile compounds, which is a equivalent of plants to cholesterol, but it has health promoting effects. And those combined with phenolic acids, you can find in cereal grains mostly. And they are both compounds which help to reduce cholesterol levels in, in the diet, but they also bring extra stability to the food because they are antioxidants. And they're, for example, <coughs> highly abundant in rice bran and therefore rice bran oil, which has good qualities in, in uh, high, high temperature deep frying applications. And so, for example, these kinds of compounds we would, or we are now able to produce in, in high quantities um, 
that could be then applied in, in the food industry or just added directly to the food to prevent oxidation to extend the shelf life and such. Whereas compared to, for example, extracting the same compounds from rice bran could be somewhat difficult as depending on the raw material, what you get because, <coughs> for example, high abundance of arsenic pollution in rice bran. And therefore, one can produce these compounds in the lab and therefore uh, inhibit or, or prevent, for example, uh, heavy metals concentrating into the product. So, for example, like y y your work might involve trying to improve the shelf life of bread so that we're reducing the amount of waste that comes out in exactly. food waste, right? Exactly. Any other examples like that where you would be improving, you know, improving shelf life or improving longevity of foods to essentially food waste is a big problem. Mm -hmm. it's, well, the research that we, we have done in my lab essentially focuses on, on cereal grains and grain products. So therefore, the bread is, is one of the study examples that we work mostly with. And there we use um, soluble dietary fibers as, um, as compounds that can then um, prevent the bread from getting stale. So it's a different type of um, shelf life restriction. Like oxidation is one where you get rancid taste and off flavors, but the bread turning stale or hard is another type where you then kind of get a physical change, uh, which then makes the product more or less appealing. So this work also provides the potential for saying improving the nutrient quality in food. So you have the potential of helping improve the, the nutrition of people's diets. Right? Definitely, yeah. I mean, these same soluble fibers that we add to the, to the bread, from the bread perspective, or from, from the production perspective, it makes the dough handling much easier. <coughs> from the bread perspective, it gives it a lot longer shelf life because um, it, get, it doesn't lose the moisture or moisture evaporation is much slower and starch does not get regurgitated that fast, so the bread stays softer for a longer time. And thirdly, for the consumer, you have all these health benefits of the dietary fiber. So you, it's, it increases satiety, it improves bowel functions, et cetera, et cetera. So there's tons of functions that the same one single compound can, can, can uh, deliver. Okay, um, uh, Chris, why don't you talk about um, uh, your role and your company's role in this, this question? Our company is, is really focused on a whole variety of areas, but maybe I'd talk about first uh, making animal protein more efficiently. And I think uh, at, the, at the core of this entire question is how can we get more nutrition generated more efficiently? Uh, one of the examples of a product that we have, uh, uh, manufacture is, is that we are the largest uh, farmers of oregano in the world. We uh, actually extract the large amounts of oregano. Uh, there are two particular chemicals there that we are really uh, interested in called carvacol and thymol. We take those chemicals in a particular ratio. We can feed those back to pigs and poultry and eliminate the need for antibiotics in their feed by feeding these natural compounds back to them. The key there is trying to make the animals produce the protein that we need more efficiently. And I think this comes back to the core question of what we're facing in 2050. You're exactly right. We're going to have more people, but the raise the nutritional level of the world, my feeling is, is that perhaps one of the most key things today missing is the adequate amount of protein. When we take a look at the number of stunted children in the world and then go do an analysis of what is missing out of their diets, Oftentimes we find that the caloric needs, in other words, absolute calories, are there. What we're usually missing is micronutrients and especially protein. And when we start and talk about perhaps uh, a sufficient amount of milk or maybe a one egg a day for, per child, this is more than sufficient that would be able to end childhood stunting. So our, our role in our company is to try to make this meat, uh, make meat production more efficient dropping the cost so that more people can afford to be able to have that protein. Certainly agree with Mark, <coughs> beef, beef is at sort of at the far end. It's a, it's a luxury compound, uh, at least in our, in our terms. But when we start and talk maybe about milk and eggs or aqua, protein from aqua, uh, certainly these are highly efficient, highly efficient. So you're trying to, in one sense, trying to in, sort of reduce the yield gap or improve the conversion ratios? Exactly. Uh, you, you, you've 
bring up the magic term, uh, feed to gain ratios. How much feed does it take to get a pound of gain or a kilo of gain? Uh, with poultry and aqua, these are the most efficient animals we have in the world for being able to do that. Uh, beef, of course, is at the very furthest extreme in being able to do that. Uh, the question is, is how can we make this more efficient, especially in areas of the world where perhaps the grains that we have or the feedstuffs that we have are not the most ideal and aren't like what we see in uh, where I come from, Iowa, a home of corn and soybeans. Uh, what sort of, what sort of uh, substrates we have there to be able to feed animals? So you're, but you are in the business of providing additives to the livestock Absolutely. feed industry to improve what rate of gain to, to optimize? I, I would say to optimize, oh, no, optimize efficiency. And uh, what the, the real purpose there has been, uh, or the tendency I should say of all of our customers is not to use drugs to do this, but to understand compounds such as enzymes, uh, plant extracts that may be able to have that, this uh, effect uh, without necessarily going into a drug or uh, steroid uh, use. Okay, so um, Richard? Yes. <laughs> Let us hear what you have to say. <laughs> you didn't even tease me with a, a little. Okay, um, first I want to. I feel like it's a 12-step program. So, you know, I used to be a genetic engineer, um, and, and then you're supposed to applaud, and then I go to the next step and say, but I got over it. Um, early in my career as a molecular biologist, I was very, very fascinated by using the best modern genetic tools uh, to optimize the performance of agricultural systems. And I was engaged in the early work in transgenesis and GMOs. Uh, in retrospect, it didn't take me long to realize that we were really missing an enormous opportunity. We were thinking of plants or animals as standalone entities, machines, really. And unfortunately, we were engineering them with the same premise that engineers use on machines. But there are enormously complex systems that support those machines. And those are not separable, really, from the plant or the animal. And we were missing an opportunity in science to consider the complexity of the entire production system and whether we can optimize the quality of what we get out, the quality of the production system, and the quality of its embedding in a social and environmental system. And I think that that's an opportunity ahead of us. But the first point is that we have to disabuse people of the idea that agriculture is natural. It's not at all. There's nothing natural about agriculture. All of us are eating the products of generations, sometimes hundreds or thousands of years of human artifice. It's all about human creativity manifest through improving the system and sometimes the machine within the system, the plant or animal, that we eat. So, as soon as we polarize it and say, well, it's synthetic now and it wasn't before, we've made this, this terrible misunderstanding that agriculture is this bucolic thing where if you leave it alone, it'll just be right. And there's no farmer that will ever tell you you can turn your back on a farm without it being ruined, organic or conventional. It requires human intervention all the time. So there's nothing natural about it. Okay, that's the first bit of dis, uh, disingenuity in the, in the title of this thing. The second is the idea that um, we really have to produce twice as much food or whatever the number is uh, in 50 years. No, we don't. We actually, Laura gave a great talk the other day that really brought home that most of the surplus that we currently uh, have in food production is lost to, to waste, and as you alluded to as well. Uh, squandering both uh, at farm gate and at storage and transport and production and in consumer level is stunning. I mean, the amount of food that is wasted, would, if it were not wasted, would probably handle the increase in population just fine. So the idea that there's an inexorable increase in production is not necessarily right. We definitely have to have an increase in the availability of nutrition. Your point is incredibly important there. Availability of quality nutrition, but without sacrificing the system in which it's created. We must never, I think, think of a cow or a pig or a wheat plant as a thing that exists in isolation of the complex ecosystem. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've discovered that what we used to think of was a thing, let's say us or a cow, is 99% microbes. So we used to think that there was an individual, and now we realize it's an almost seamless web of living organisms that give it its properties. Well, that's a huge opportunity for genetic optimization, not by GMOs, but by adjusting the concentrations of microbes to build a system that's more resilient and produces higher quality nutrition. So I guess in summary, what I'd say is, first of all, <clears throat> we have an industrial agriculture system right now. There's no doubt about it. So any efforts we can make, such as the one that Chris is talking about, that can improve that are incredibly important. 
What we can also do, however, is pull the lens back and say, can we stimulate new types of small and medium enterprise that are science driven, that can allow completely new approaches to agricultural enhancements and new enterprises, new profit centers to be developed that are sustainable and socially integrated. So that's what I think we should do. You have some examples that you might think about? Uh, yeah, I do actually. Uh, if you envision uh, the classic multinationals that dominate global agriculture, you'll have to ask why do they do that? Well, 20 years ago they didn't. And so we have this, this chain of, of uh, in a sense, supply chain consolidation of foundation seed, distribution, enhancements, and now increasingly um, management advice. It doesn't have to be that way, but there are certain tools that have made it that way. So when I was working with Rockefeller Foundation here in Asia on their rice programs, it became clear that the public sector is almost completely ignorant of how hard it is to make stuff. Uh, and so the public sector thinks you do cool science, publish it in a top journal, and that's where you quit. And yet 98% of the work to make stuff is not the stuff that we as scientists publish. It's aggregating all the other skills. So I guess I'd say it's, it's the, the title of this thing. It's what if scientists become chefs? You always imagine a chef as being the wizard with the cool hat doing the neat stuff. But in fact, a chef can't exist without a restaurant, without really good sourcing of ingredients, without sous chefs, without, uh, without prep cooks, without waiters, waitresses, without the infrastructure. And that's true for us as well. Scientists might like to think of ourselves as chefs, but we are chefs who are totally ignorant of the restaurant business. And what we have to do is better integrate the science into the awareness of what business requires to turn science into value for people. And we don't do that. So there's the, the point of intervention is change the public sector. If you don't like Monsanto, don't bitch about it. Make better alternatives. Okay, so. <laughs> Duh, in a word. <laughs> so we've already been, I mean, in one sense, the, the food supply that we have, it's like that corn plant that stands in Iowa is totally dependent upon us to exist. Yeah. That livestock that we think of as, quote, natural is completely reliant. Unless you eat roadkill and berries, you're not, <laughs> you're not natural. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so in one, in one respect, on one end of the spectrum, we have, we have the idea that we're going to somehow grow food, high quality protein in a lab, yet on the other hand, we're already playing an artificial role in, in creating and sustaining the food system that we already have. So it's... For a thousand years. Gro growing protein in the lab is just one more way to make protein. It's another, it's another mechanism. And is it any better or worse than growing animals? To me, it's about the efficiency of protein that's going to nourish us. And if we can nourish ourselves more efficiently, that's a better thing. And it's also going to do things like, if we're trying to do things like save rainforests and stop cutting rainforests, we need to do more with the landscapes we've and that's, that's already where, devoted yeah, to farming. And, and that's where the more efficiency, efficiency comes down. Because when we start and take a look at beef, if, if the entire world was only beef consuming, there, there would be an easy, it, this, that would be a completely easy fix. But we start and compare, say, to maybe aqua and, and also in the poultry production. And uh, it gets a little more complex because it's going to be, it's going to be difficult for, to be able to say, make fish protein, and maybe Mark can comment on that, make fish protein as efficiently as fish can convert, uh, convert feed That's into, fe into That's meat. That's interesting point. That's going to be a tough one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess the question I'd have for, for you, Mark, is that you know, the idea of producing beef in the lab is one thing. And what you can look at the different, we call them in agriculture, feed conversion ratios, pounds of grain to produce a pound of meat. And it's like with cattle, it might be eight. With pigs, it might be uh, 2.5. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. With fish, it's going down. Yeah. Going down. <laughs> with fish, it can be uh, maybe even slightly more point, than one. Point nine five. Right, and so you're almost like in a negative, it's like you're getting more, you get more fish in, food. out yeah. than you're putting in. So Moisture content. Is, the, <laughs> is, the main, is the main impediment to having a more, say, fish protein diet, the, the cultural imperative to eat beef, or the long-term traditional idea of we're gonna uh, I don't know, be a cowboy? What? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, I, I, obviously there is a huge cultural aspect here. And um, so we are working on the assumption that um, 
and, and the FAO as well, that eating beef is not going to uh, diminish in the next 30 years, it's actually going to increase. Because as you said, it's a luxury item and when people become richer, they will start to eat beef. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, uh, you know, we also want diversity. We also want to have choices. Um, when we become more um, uh, sophisticated, we want more choices in our food. So they, in, in the end, it's, it's up to the consumer. And I'm working under the assumption that we are not going to affect that consumer behavior on a massive scale very quickly. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I think it's wise to have a strategy to come up with a, a protein production system that produces the same tissue that everybody wants or that some people want, um, but without the, the negative consequences. Is it going to be a situation, though, with growing lab protein? I mean, it's like in the energy field, the question is, all, is always, well, how can you produce, say, renewables at the same price that you're producing energy from fossil fuels? And the, and the question here in the food situation would be then, are you going to be able to be economically competitive? Or does it depend upon what you look at as costs for production? If <coughs> Eventually, this is going to be economically competitive because you have to put uh, less resources into it. Um, mm. So it, it has to be economically uh, competitive at, at some point. The, uh, the other thing that we are, I guess, also from a cultural perspective, because it's one thing to look at food quality um, or protein quality, it's, it's also, you know, biodiversity. Um, we are, yeah, fish are very efficient animals, but we humans are very efficient fishers. <laughs> and um, we, we have drained our, uh, a lot of oceans from uh, the fish, so we have to be careful, and, and yes, we can culture them, we can cultivate them in, in ponds, but we have to be careful that we um, also maintain a level of biodiversity, which, which I quite strongly believe in, although it's very difficult to measure. And so for other species, there might be other reasons to start to think about alternative ways of producing the same tissue. You know, Dennis, uh, can I intervene? You made a really terrific point using the, the comment of biodiversity, but there's, a, there's a, an add-on to that. There's, there's actually intellectual diversity that we need to con cont contemplate and economic diversity. I, what I'd like to see is Mark's thing, give it its best shot. And if it works, as you say, if, it, if the economics are there and the demand is there, that's fine. But what we really need is hundreds or thousands of best shots of different ideas and let people sample what works well in their culture and their situation with their environment. Uh, and I think we shouldn't assume that we just have to make more of the same. And I th I'm much more sanguine about changing norms, I think, than, than the assumption of not being able to. If you look at food waste, you can couple economic incentives to changing norms and behavior very easily. Once it is illuminated, uh, how much money a household in any part of the world can save by some simple practice changes, it will come home to roost, and I think people will change behavior. Uh, so norms don't have to change just because you write it up in the New York Times or something. It can act, or National Geographic, they can actually, <laughs> sorry, whoops. Uh, but you can change them enormously when they're coupled to self-interest. And so one of the things that social enterprise is very, very good at doing is identifying how you galvanize enlightened self-interest in diverse communities. So one thing we've assumed as scientists that, that people that look like us and work in fairly nice infrastructures and that come to meetings like this are going to be a source of the solution. And we should think of ourselves, I suspect, as enablers, as you do, of the livestock industries. Um, if you're an enabler, your effect is so much more profound than you can have if you try to come up with a solution yourself. Um, so I'm absolutely barracking for more social enterprises with creative science-based solutions that can give Marx a run for his money, and if he wins, that's what you should do. Okay, so while we're on that, then let's pivot and let's start talking about, uh, I mean, the, some of the sort of, some of the issues that are, are the issues that we need to be uh, think of, thinking about in terms of trade-offs. What are the, uh, so I will, I will raise this. So when I first heard I was going to be involved in a panel about synthetic foods and, and that they are inevitable and they're coming, I, I, I kept thinking, oh, well, gee, there's all of these societal, cultural, political questions that are inevitable that are going to be raised. And, and we've been dealing with these same questions for, with genetically modified organisms now for 20 years and we're still fighting about them. And so what, if we haven't been able to, to establish 
a sort of a sense of societal acceptance for these for a variety of reasons. You know, what, what are the kinds of questions that we should be thinking about uh, that are potential um, speed bumps or roadblocks that we can anticipate so, so that we can, can sort of help educate and inform the public about being transparent about this, trying to help people understand the value of this kind of work. So, uh, Laura? Well, I think um, the first thing, of course, is that we as scientists have to do it all very much openly, very, have everything very transparently available, the information there. And also, uh, not only utilize the possibilities that we have for evaluating the safety of these compounds and, and uh, all the effects that they will have on, on um, let's say, environmental health and our own health, etc., to have all, all those methods, like really find the methods that can ensure that they are safe, they're um, safe for us to use, safe, for, safe to produce, etc., but then also keep on. Uh, improving those methods further, so so really making sure that the um, safety aspects for, are, are um, covered for, without any any possible um, holes in, in any, so that the, the bag of water is really really tight, and um, then also have and aim for and hope for um, critical uh, communication about it, but also fair communication and neutral communication and always um, finding ways like when once, once I guess also you must have experienced all these outroars of people coming to you and saying you're like when you're, why are you producing synthetic meat that's unnatural and so on. So to be able to find also neutral platforms for people to be able to discuss these questions, show their concerns, be able to receive information from neutral sources and, uh, and people who are who are capable of answering the questions and all this in open and not just trying for us um, scientists to work in the lab and, and on our own and then coming up with this uh, solution and, and say here is the solution but rather trying to involve all the stakeholders and, and making it public. Okay, I'm gonna start bringing the audience in in just a minute but I wanna go to Chris and the rest of you first. You know, the, the thing that I see in, in regards to what really is, what was the mistake that was made with GMOs? You know, why, why has it taken 20 years and GMOs are not accepted worldwide? The, the United States has broad acceptance, although an increasing minority now also starting to grow in the United States of non-acceptance. What is the, what's the core, what's the core lesson from that? To me, it was that as soon as new technology is introduced, there has to be some sort of advantage for the end consumer or an, 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 and an advantage large enough that that will outweigh the things that I might worry about in regards to this new technology. Maybe I don't understand it in, uh, so fully, but the, the advantages are so great that I will actually utilize it. And that, I think in GMO, the problem was that in GMOs, there was, it was not clear to the consumer that there was a clear advantage to them. There was an enormous advantage to the farmers, without a doubt. Uh, our hometown of Des Moines, Iowa, 500,000 people, we used to have uh, atrazine uh, in, our, in our drinking water because that's what was sprayed all over the state of Iowa. <clears throat> Today, we have no atrazine because it's all Roundup, and we have a... a and you have lots of nitrates in the water. Have, now we have a lot of nitrates in the water in Des Moines, Iowa, so that's another issue. But, it's, uh, but I guess what it is, is it comes back to the, what is the advantage for the end so, consumer. Okay, communication, transparency, and then a and benefit, to, and a to, benefit. The to the eater. To the eater. It has to right. be to the person consuming it. Right. Uh, Richard? Yeah, I, this is a... There's no way to say what's right or not, but I've heard this point of view from a lot of people in industry, and it certainly has a lot of merit. I mean, it, you, you listen to this and it sounds, that makes a lot of sense. My experience having been in the, the GMO craft as the, one of the few neither academic nor corporate actors uh, working as I did as a molecular biologist for the FAO of the United Nations for years, my assertion is that it's about power structures. Uh, it's about distrust of, no, of non-transparent power structures, and the early adopters of the, of the technology uh, as Chris pointed out, we're really contributing substantially to the effectiveness of the industrial agriculture practitioners. I mean, no-till activities, better and less toxic uh, herbicides, 
decreasing on cotton production, millions of liters of very toxic insecticides. The benefits are totally quantifiable to the, to the growers and to the environment. There's no doubt about that in any scientific forum that's ever looked at it wisely. However, what is true is that there was an early war of attrition uh, that happened between what were initially small family or medium-sized family companies and the desire to dominate the food chain. Um, the companies that are practicing this are full of actually a lot of people I know and like are good scientists and sometimes good business people, but because they're very large corporations, they give us a very, very funny feeling at the pit of our stomach. Because to be honest, the issue you raised, Mark, about culture is really at the core of agriculture. There's nothing, nothing else that we as humans do that's essential except food and water. Everything else, even the iPhone, is really <laughs> optional, okay? And so there's a built-in concern about the normative and, and cultural basis of the provision of food because it makes us very vulnerable. Now, most of us don't understand the food system anyway, but we like to think that if it's local, it has resonance with us and we have Local feedback. and natural. And well, <laughs> we, you know, we can go to the farmer's market. And yeah. Exactly, but a lot of that is the normative comfort zone. And the challenge, I think, is that had had Roundup Ready soybeans been developed by Stein uh, or by a family-owned company, one reason your company is so trusted isn't just the good products, it's because it's a family company. And this has an evocative resonance with most people. If we had 50 or 60 interesting competing companies, not just to make the same thing, but to make different types of interventions, I think people would have seen that is going to be looking out for so our best So maybe interests. something had been invented by our neighbor. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit much, but I mean, but, <laughs> but let's put it this way. I think having to, uh, technology a democratized process where the entry barriers are acceptably low, they'll never be zero, but where using technology can be based on a sense of community sensitivities. I mean, most of us would love to get our bread from a baker, not from the supermarket, but many times for convenience, we go to the supermarket. It's the same thing with technology-based solutions. If we can get technology-based solutions that have local resonance, they also have local accountability. And I think people will look at science and technology very differently when there has that. So I would love to see tens of thousands of companies producing all sorts of new innovations using science and technology that are different from each other, not a large corporate monoculture doing one or two things very, very well, but just one or two things. More diversity. Yeah. Coming uh, back to your point. Mark, uh, I'll turn to you and then I want to open it up. So right. these trade-offs, these Yeah, well, I think um, they have pretty much covered. I think transparency is a big thing that also uh, translates into what, um, what Richard said. Um, there's the regulatory aspects that um, uh, eventually should cover some of the safety aspects. What was striking in the response of the audience was that um, you know, when you look at, when you ask the question, do you trust the product if it's developed by scientists, and in other words, do you trust the scientists? Very, very few people <laughs> do that. But we did. <laughs> right. Yeah, you and, and three other people, um, which is, uh, you know, so um, it's not only companies, it's also scientists. Uh, everybody who messes with our food or tries to mess with our food is by definition sort of suspect. And um, yeah, we can, I think in a lot of ways, we can come up with an efficient sort of production system that has a local feel. I think it can be done. But there also then, for this to go forward, there almost needs to be a preemptive transparency that was absent with GMOs if, if we're going to move forward with some of this kind of... Yeah, synth. I think in, in addition to, to the very good point, the point that it didn't have an immediate uh, benefit for the consumer, it also had a big transparency issue. Right. Um, from the, from the very uh, start. And it still has, it continues to have. Uh, so it, it, yeah, I think transparency is key. Okay, so I'm gonna open it up. Uh, questions, uh, queries? Concerns? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the safety problem is very serious and many, uh, many words, so I need to ask in Chinese, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, the microphone is not working. So just now you mentioned a lot of uh, issues related to the GMOs. Uh, 
and about uh, increasing the, uh, the transparency of the GMOs, I would like to ask uh, how the American government cope with this issue. Just now, one panelist mentioned that uh, the American government actually supports the GMO. I would like to uh, clarify whether this is the case and whether the American government uh, supports the GMO. And uh, be be so after this uh, information is released, what's the response of, of the general public from the USA? The second question is, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot my second question. Okay, so the first question was about public government response to GMOs in the United States. I'm from Australia. He's from the Netherlands. You're from Finland. You're from Iowa. I'm from the. I, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll take the United States one. Um, you know, the uh, GMOs went, underwent a huge amount of regulatory scrutiny before they were released into into the environment in the United States, and the uh, the USDA was primarily the primary uh, group that did this, and. Uh, they have had enough credibility with the American public that after the GMOs were released, there was no really significant outcry at all. And thus, uh, the consumption, say, of vegetable oil, uh, which is uh, enormous within the United States, is, is today uh, almost in the plus 95 percentile of uh, consumption. Um, lately, and I think maybe that's, that's been uh, of, it, of interest, is, is that lately, there has now been a question about GMOs and perhaps that GMOs should be, the food should be labeled that contains GMOs. I can tell you from the standpoint of agriculture that this may sound strange, but we would really welcome that because there are higher profit margins in non-GMO foods <coughs> because they are so less, that is so less efficient to be able to produce that we uh, can, we can, charge uh, consumers an enormous <laughs> amount of money for, for non-GMO products. And so uh, you will see that most of the uh, companies in the United States are very softly actually opposing these rules to actually expand some of the non-GMOs. They, they, as far as they're concerned, this is an opportunity for more money. <laughs> and if you look at who's actually supporting much of the labeling, it's very, very large multinational or large national <laughs> organic companies. The, the, there's a beautiful wordsmithing going on here that we think natural is agriculture, which it's not, and organic is super cool. <laughs> and in fact, these are huge billion dollar corporations, and they love this premium Chris is talking about. So hey, if we label it, we make more money off the consumer. So part of it is really a truth, uh, is understanding what labels mean or w what's behind what's on a label. And I think really what we should do is have a label that describes pretty much what color cap the farmer wore when he harvested it or she harvested it because that's probably got as much to do with the safety of the product as as the, whether it's GMO or not but hey transparency and everything and I think the John Deere cap versus the case is the one I'd go for we'll put coupons in the cereal box for you so any next tastier than the cereal yes ma'am <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I'm a farmer from China, from Dalian. Questions. The first questions uh, for your five person. Which one oh, is a peasant now? Are you a scientist or pa farmer? I want to ask you the first question. Are you a scientist or farmer? The second one, which kind of <coughs> OSM food you eat in ordinary life? The third one, in China, uh, GMO uh, are scary in the hearts of every Chinese person. Well, in China, GMO is a scary concept. Therefore, I want to know all the more, uh, because the question was raised by a uh, uh, speaker uh, about uh, the regulations of GMO in the United States. Do you think it is absolutely safe to export GMOs to other countries? These are the three questions I have. I'm sorry, I missed the, I heard the, the, the third one about our Are you a farmer or a scientist? Yeah. Me? <laughs> Who? You? Us, I guess. Us. Us? Um, I am 
I am not a scientist. I am not a farmer. I grew up on a farm. Uh, I earned money to go to college by farming. I studied agriculture in college and have a graduate degree in agricultural communications. Okay. I'm a, a medical doctor. I um, live on a farm, uh, but I only have a vegetable garden. <laughs> I'm a food scientist. I'm a wannabe urban farmer uh, but, or vegetable gardener, but uh, don't have a garden myself. I'm a scientist, and also I have uh, our, our company farms large amounts, and I will maintain that if you're a successful farmer, you're also a scientist. Oh, that's a lovely statement. <laughs> that's a very wise statement. Uh, I live on an apple farm that I manage appallingly. Uh, I'm a scientist. Uh, which career I manage appallingly. Um, and that's a great statement, though, because farmers really are some of the best observational manipulators in the world, which is really science. So, next round. What was the next question? Oh. Was, uh, what do we eat, what do each of us eat uh, in regards to organic, GMO, et cetera, and when we make personal food choices? Wow, okay, I missed that part, good. Uh, I, I eat lots of vegetables and, and uh, yeah. Uh, salads, and I can say that we have grilled chicken perhaps once a week, and that's the extent of the meat in our diet for the most part, but lots of pulses, beans. I eat pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's edible. <laughs> and have complete trust of scientists and companies that provide my food. I also eat everything. <laughs> Um, I, I definitely eat everything. I avoid organic. Uh, and I, I do that because um, I worry about the relative level of microbiological microbiolo safety of organic products. Uh, very well controlled in non-organic, but not as well controlled in organic products. <laughs> <laughs> I am what I am. Uh, I just, you eat. I eat. <laughs> Therefore, I am. <laughs> and then what was the last one? So, there was something more interesting. It's about GMOs and, and uh, being and, safe. Again, and the U.S. government the question. The U.S. government. Maybe maybe she could repeat it. Oh, export. Is it safe to export? Sure. Are GMOs safe and should they be exported? <laughs> what to export? Yeah, but don't unload the damn things. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't have a, I mean, if the if the U.S. government has said that it's okay to grow them, I don't have a problem with that. It, the question of whether or not they should be exported, I guess, should be a question for the countries who've chosen to import them or not. Can I, can I actually, I think the core of the question has to do with, in some ways, China's food sovereignty, if I understand you correctly. Uh, I spent many years working with China's best plant geneticists and plant molecular biologists, working with Rockefeller Foundation and many other organizations here in China. Uh, and I got to know many of the finest uh, scientists I've ever known who are working and still working here in China, whom I trust very much. Uh, example, the great uh, Zhang Qifa in Wuhan, one of the finest rice geneticists I've ever known, brilliant scientist. Um, he's had his hands tied, as have many other Chinese scientists, by the lack of clarity of priorities in using modern genetic research in China. Uh, there is enormous possibility for completely domestic industries, 100% autonomous domestic industries that use the very best of modern genetics. Most of the patents that are being taken out are still largely not in force in China for the older technologies. And China is now the largest patenting entity in the world. So autonomous scientific development of new types of agriculture within China is fully within China's grasp if there's political will. There's extraordinarily good science within this country. Okay, unless anybody else, I'm gonna uh, have, somebody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. I have a question that's just slightly peripheral to the, the main part of the discussion, and that's something that came to mind in terms of, uh, I thought of it in combining the adequate nutrition comments, I thought of it in combining the food waste comments, and if you look at the um, uh, differences in chronic disease susceptibilities around the world that are associated with the diet, you see um, Western countries where you're basically eating too much meat and developing countries where you don't have adequate nutrition because you don't have things like one egg a day would be a great luxury. And um, also something that has come up is basically the consumer behavior, how adaptable is uh, consumer behavior. So I was wondering if you guys could comment <clears throat> on the fact that maybe 
reducing the urgency of the problem could be changing people's changing people's dietary habits. For example, what would be the situation if the people eating too much meat would eat a diet more like Change yours? Change their view about what's necessary. Yeah, yeah. How much could even with where we are now, with having with having some sort of equilibration, is is this is this possible? And I, and like I said, it's just it's not. I'm not suggesting this in place of the main part so of what how, we're talking about. So how high do we really to need it. to eat on the food chain? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. May I just say one quick response, which is more technological, because we only have a couple of minutes. There are a very large number of interesting startup companies, uh, amongst them Pat Brown's company called Impossible Foods, that are trying to use completely vegetable sourced proteins and fats, because that's essential, to create really exciting, tasty foods that are 100% plant-based. Um, so for those that are concerned about animal growth and using more wise use of plant resources, there are actually scientific approaches, which admittedly are techno fixes to this. What you're, the heart of your question is vastly more interesting with lo, no time here about can we change cultural norms and expectation behavior in three minutes. But that's an interesting question that perhaps question. comes out of this. And I think as we're running out of time, I think each of you panelists think about that. That's one interesting question to take forward out of this. Mm. What are others that, you know, could come out of this that then could perhaps inoculate future discussions on this. Just a small comment. You know, I, I always say the most potent chemical on earth is DNA. And our DNA is, has, we have evolved so strongly over so many years that we have to eat meat and fat. Those are, those, uh, those to our ancestors who were able to find the most fat and the most meat and maybe some sugars how about salt? Yeah. And then salt was always a, that was a luxury, but as we had to have that too. But meat and, meat and fat were the, we, they were the ones who survived. Ooh, and were able to breathe. million Indians that might not agree with you on that. Right. <laughs> right. There are a lot of them. <laughs> so in one sense, I mean, going forward, it's like how to, Changing that's going to be hard. Changing that sort of cultural yeah. tradition of needing meat and fat. Right? Mm -hmm. Can we change that? That's going to be very tough. That's the very tough. With beer. <laughs> Laura, I mean, questions going forward that we can think about out of this? Well, I think the question to going further what that we should think, think about is how to, how to distribute. And I mean, we can try to change consumer behavior to average, for example, the meat consumption. So <coughs> from the highest meat eaters and, and then distribute that around the world. But I think overall, the whole scene is so polarized. Like there are those who are in favor of synthetic food and those who are totally against GMO and are for organic and for, and, and then there is the biggest mass in between. But I think sort of um, trying to distribute it and trying to um, <coughs> sort of soften some of the, the edges uh, is, is an approach that we need to take, both from, from um, just the thought point of view, but also how to distribute the food and how to uh, equally manage the global food production and, and food chain. How to find common ground between extreme views in the f as it relates to food? Exactly. Mark? Well, um, uh, I have to agree with, uh, disagree with uh, Chris about the, the, the need for animal proteins. We don't need animal proteins. There are two billion people on this planet who are involuntarily uh, vegetarian. Um, if you want to look ahead, what's going to happen with uh, meat consumption uh, being ingrained in our cultures and being ingrained also in the in the ideas of people who, when, when they become richer, they want to uh, eat meat, um, is that if you, if you do that observation right now, um, the only continent right now where meat consumption is going down is Western Europe. Um, so yes, it can happen over time. Interestingly, in the United States, there, the, the amount of meat consumption is twice as much as in Europe, and that is still leveling off. And it, it may at some point go down as well. We all expect that it will. But globally, that's, that's at least not the trend in the next 30 years. What happens after that? Will we all become vegetarian? Can we all become vegetarian? We can. Will we do it? I'm not so sure. So we're out of time. And so one thing I would say to come back to our original question is, what if the organisms we eat are made by humans and not by nature? By and large, what we've come to the conclusion is that, well, they already are. <laughs> anyway, thanks to our panelists and for all of you uh, for being here uh, this afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.